I was stressing out last night, uh, brushing up on all my classical music knowledge, and I wrote to you at 2.45 a.m. I said, oh, should we, can we play maybe some of this composer who I'd looked up on Wikipedia and that composer? And then I thought to myself, oh, you know, there's so many versions of all these songs. And then you wrote back within five minutes. You said, well, yeah, we should play these people, but I could play them. So why don't we begin with you playing something on the Wurlitzer, uh, something old school, so to speak, um, that maybe sounds a little bit new uh, in your mind. Uh, yes, it, it, the Wurlitzer is missing the C3, and it's out of tune, but I think it's, it's going to be OK. By the way, uh, please welcome Francesco Tristano. <laughs> Who was that? <clears throat> this was um, a piece by Orlando Gibbons, um, English composer, mid uh, 17th century. And he was before Bach, correct? Definitely, definitely, about a century before Bach. And what's uh, special about him in your mind? You have him on your bio, I think, or it's mentioned on your website as being a particular influence on you or a particular interest. Yeah, I, I love the harmonies. Uh, I think um, we uh, we tend to think of old music as being something um, different uh, from new music, which it is by the standard of time, but by the standards of harmony and rhythm, it is not necessarily so. And um, I think this sounds like plaid um, for most most parts, more than it sounds like Bach. Um, it's modal. It's not. Uh, it's not following a tonal system. It's fo following a modal system. And um, you know, Plaid is using modes as well. So um, I. Th I think it's. It's that. That harmonic um, language that that was just very interesting to me from uh, early age on. I always loved old music. Um, problem mm -hmm. is, there's no piano at the time. This is. Um, this is not written for piano because there was no piano at the time. So. Um, and it was certainly not written for Wur Wurlitzer. <laughs> but, um. Um, you make a, quite a point about uh, things not being written for piano. Um, your, one of your first albums, I guess, your first electronic, so to speak, albums called Not For Piano, a lot of pieces not for piano. Seems like a very important idea of taking things and putting them in the context of a different instrument and seeing what can happen. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, so the, the piano is this instrument. Um, it's a beautiful instrument. It's huge. Uh, the design is, is so um, impressive and, and big. Um, but we the image we have of the piano is the Im image of you know 19th century music, maybe uh, some high scale salon, um, Parisian style, maybe some wigs even, you know. Um, and that's I think kind of the wrong, the wrong, the wrong image. When the piano appeared uh, about 1750, a little before 1740, uh, it was such a crazy instrument that most composers didn't want to use it. They're like, that's too big, it's too crazy, uh, I can't do anything. Bach didn't like it. He, he probably saw a very early prototype, which uh, wasn't, prob wasn't good, I suppose. But um, he said, nah, that's not for me. And so um, I happen to like music that's you know, from a very old time, uh, before the piano uh, existed even and very contemporary music where the piano is no longer valid as an instrument like techno, for example. So um, it's kind of this extreme uh, repertoire of playing the very old stuff and then trying to do something new, um, but always with the idea that uh, the piano is an instrument of the future. It's always been. 
uh, it became, in the course of uh, one century, the most used instrument by composers. Uh, while Bach didn't want to touch it or said um, not interested, uh, about a century later, every hotshot composer was uh, was a pianist and was using the piano as a main uh, source of uh, expression. But obviously now that all these hotshot composers have used it, there's a lot of baggage that's been put upon the piano. When you come to it, you hear it, especially in popular culture, I think, if you're not uh, playing it, it seems like this romantic, uh, quaint sort of wigs uh, wearing salon thing. And I wonder, um, I read in an interview with you once, you said um, that the piano is a percussion instrument. And I think that's a, a big break um, in terms of your thinking. And I wonder at what point you kind of had that sort of epiphany that the piano is not this romantic, quaint thing that we can do all sorts of things. Was it very early on? Was it an immediate thing? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I wanted to be a drummer. So, um, but I, I happen to have a piano at home. Um, which probably was a strategic move by my mom, but um, I wanted to play the drums, so I suppose my first uh, steps at the piano were trying to imitate the drums, sort of playing clusters in the low register, and uh, I, there's pictures of me walking with the feet, you know, on the on the keyboard. And then I, eventually I got a drum set, um, and, uh, you know, as soon as I was done with the practicing, uh, I went... Uh, to the basement, and I, I played the drums the whole afternoon. Your mom made you put it in the basement. Yeah, it was. Sure. She didn't get the drum set for me, though. It was my uncle. You know, one day he come by and said, "The cool it. uncle." Yes. Um, but yeah, the piano is definitely a percussion instrument by um, by the te by the, uh, the the mechanics of the instrument, because um, and this is the same mechanic actually, but you don't see it when you press the key. There is a whole mechanism where. In the end, after uh, a whole bunch of back and forth, there's a hammer hitting on the on the string. So um, we we cannot really con control that. Um, it's like the the attack and the decay of the piano is not changeable. It's always gonna, it's always going to be the same. There's a few keyboard instruments um, which emulate sort of vibrato playing, like a clavichord, which uh, I believe was Bach's favorite. Um, uh, keyboard instrument, where you have an aftertouch, sort of like um, s sort of like a nice synthesizer. You can press the key, and whatever you do with the finger later, you can hear it. A piano doesn't doesn't react, so it's kind of a stupid instrument by by terms of um, you know attack because it's percussion, it's percussion based. But then um, I think the cool thing about the piano is that you can create the illusion of uh, many instruments. You can uh, create the illusion of a string instrument. Uh, you can create uh, the illusion of a wind instrument. And of course, you, you have a, the very instrumental keyboard uh, sound, which, which you can bring out. So this leads me to believe that, in fact, it's a synthesizer. You know? um, and I, this, I was studying. Um, uh, I was. Uh, studying classical music, I suppose, but in a non-classical city. I mean, New York is classic, but it's not necessarily classical. And um, I realized this this could be some kind of synthesizer. And especially when I start going inside the piano and um, fooling around with the overtones, and uh, which is basically the resonance of a filter. And uh, depending on how much you press um, the, the string, you, you have an effect which is like cutoff, basically. And then you have the pedal, which is like the release or the sustain. So it really is some sort of, um, you know, uh, ancestral synthesizer. Even though you said you haven't had a normal classical upbringing to an outsider's view, you went to Juilliard, you went to, um, did all of the, the practicing. You have all these classical CDs out. Were your parents sort of the typical taskmasters? You're practicing two hours, 
three hours, four hours a day uh, growing up? Were they um, cracking the whip, so to speak? Or was it something that you immediately took to early on? No, I wasn't... Um I wasn't forced uh, to do anything. I just, I just enjoyed it very much. I suppose it took me a while to realize that I wanted to do that. Maybe around 12 or 13, I knew I was going to use the piano in some way. I wasn't sure exactly how. But then, I guess what was confusing my mother is that I always wanted to do something else. So I was um, studying classical music, but in my free hours, I was improvising jazz and just uh, try to digest the real book and, and the chord changes and the choruses and stuff. And then I went to New York and I got into electronic music and then I was like, that's, that's what I want to do now. That's what I want to explore and um, to understand or try to understand. Um, and by, by then, I, jazz had already sort of faded. I had a few jazz projects going, but uh, I sort of um, dropped these and um, I got into, you know, got into turntables and uh, mixing boards and all that gear, and I, I really dipped into it. Um, but always with, with the idea to combine it with the piano sound, because I thought the piano sound could be, um, you know, could be s still evolving. Um, that's something else about the, the very basic design of the piano. It's a design that's been uh, evolving for 200 years. We think the piano has been the same for 200 years, but it's not. Um, in fact, um, I just I was in Japan this summer with um, with Yamaha. I went to see the Yamaha factory and uh, the technology uh, used to fabricate a piano is just unbelievable. I mean, and there's new models, new prototypes coming out every year, uh, new technology, new uh, mechanical uh, instruments, new pedals, new. It's it's a constant evolution. I remember you saying. Um when you were recording your last album in Detroit, that you found a piano that you liked uh, very much, and you had to wait many months before it became available, uh, before you could record the album. So every piano, like every guitar, like every whatever, sounds a little bit different. A lot different, I think. Um, yeah, the thing is, it's so big, we can't travel with our instruments. Only very few lucky people can do that. Um, you know, it's half a ton. You know, if you put that on the on the airplane, um, it's kind of complicated. Yeah. So in Detroit, there was one instrument that really I really thought could be great for for my album, and then I had to wait a year actually until it was available or until I was available at the same time as the piano, and um, we brought it into uh, Carl's studio, and um, Planet E became sort of a piano piano auditorium for for a week and um i was i was so happy that i could get that piano i that was basically i think the foremost inspiration for the album was the sound of that piano how was it different to the other pianos that you saw in detroit what was it about that i can become very geeky about the piano uh, let's do it okay um so fundamentally steinway is um is an important brand and it has two factories, one in Hamburg, one in New York. And uh, the markets are st strictly divided. So you won't find uh, Hamburg Steinway in, in the US. You will find a few, but it's not, it's not current. Um, the New York Steinway is, uh, has a different design. You can, you can recognize it. Um, it has a, it's edgier by the keyboard, it's edgier than Hamburg is sort of round, rounded, rounded off. And uh, it's basically a different of, uh, of the base, the base register. I, th I find the, um, uh, the New York uh, Steinways to be much more slamming in the bass. And um, I mean, for my music, it's, it's what I need. I need something that, uh, like I said, like percussion instrument, I need the bass register to be Sort of. If you're going to record a Planet E, you need that. Yeah, definitely, because you have to you fight have against bass. all the other instruments in the studio, all the synthesizers, um, all the uh, effect effect boxes. But um, it's it's kind of like um, a good piano. You know, you know right away. You play one, uh, you play one chord, and you're like, yeah, or you're like, no. And basically, you know, sometimes you're stuck with a bad piano, and you have to you have to go w with it. So. Um, but not if you're going to record your album, I think. 
you want to you want it to be um why were you in new york how did you get there um for the first time when you're talking about discovering techno earlier right right um i visited new york um when i was a teenager and i i was staying at a friend's apartment with my mom um on the upper west side and uh, we were walking around i was playing the piano was playing concertos at the time and stuff and we walked by the, the Juilliard school and said this could be this could be a cool place to to hang out to study and so um three years later I was uh, accepted or maybe it was a couple of years later and um so you know the term conservatory um <laughs> you know you want to conserve something i suppose you want to conserve a tradition or um like you call it the luggage, you know, the, um, uh, but then there's also the times after the conservatory, you know, which is New York City. So um, I did my, I did my studies uh, decently, okay, and um, practiced a lot. But then there was all the other part. Um, you were a good student. Yes, I was. I, I suppose I was. Um, but for me, the, the main, the main thing about, uh, being in a conservatory <laughs> is to try to be uh, exactly the opposite of a, a conservative person. And uh, in that sense, Juilliard was great because uh, basically there's one exam to get in and one exam to get out. And w once you're in, you do what you want. And um, I, there's a great music lab, for example. It seems uh, interesting that, you know, there's one exam to get in, one exam to get out, but it's still so conservative. You can do whatever you want, but everyone's not really taking advantage, would you say? Well, everybody is, is a relative term. I found some great people uh, at Juilliard. I found, uh, I met my partner, piano partner, Rami Khalife, who's, uh, we teamed up for the project Aufgang, and he's kind of my alter ego. We, um, we connect on, on many, many, um, many levels. And we basically spend our afternoons uh, improvising. Uh, once we're done with the classes, you know, we were listening to a lot of techno at the time and then just go into a practice room and improvise for hours. But, you know, constant BPM sort of thing. And, um, yeah, some people walk by, f you know, the practice rooms are like, what's going on here? It's walk, walk out again. Um, it doesn't matter how conservative people are. Um, it, really, it really doesn't matter because uh, you'll find conservative people anywhere. You'll find them uh, in jazz, you'll find them in electronic music, you find them in classical music. Um, for me, it's, it was just about trying to take in as much as I could. And New York City has so much to give, not only electronic music. In fact, electronic music is kind of limited now in, in New York City. Maybe it was a little better 10 years ago. When did you arrive? Uh, 98. 98, 2003 were my years. So right around the time that Giuliani was coming in, which is exactly. the tail end exactly. of a really powerful moment in club culture in New York. Yeah, a sad moment, I suppose, in club culture because uh, many uh, many bars and clubs had their license revoked, so you could not dance, even though there was a DJ. Uh, I remember in the East Village a few a few nights out where uh, just pumping music and you know great vibes, and then you know you start moving, and then no, no, I'm sorry, you can't dance. You can't dance, so that was, was kind of uh, kind of interesting that you can uh, sense you put such a censorship on on people and also giving them the music because it was sounding, you know. But there were places that you could dance. Well, Where definitely. was the place that meant the most to you? Uh, it was this place called Vinyl. Um, Danny Tenaglia, be yourself. He, I guess, was my. Uh, we never met, but I, I learned so much from his sets. They would go for 10, 12 hours. And um, it was in, the vinyl didn't have an alcohol license, so there was no, there was no alcohol, uh, which, again, as a European in New York, seemed completely extravagant. And um, I probably was uh, underage anyways. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it was about you know, listening, to, listening to, the, to the sets and then trying to f figure out what tunes they were. And then I realized, you know, Detroit techno is uh, very prominent, trying to get the CDs, trying to get the LPs. And basically, 
uh, you know, I didn't, uh, yeah, I wasn't a student at Red Bull Music Academy. I didn't know how to, how to do it, so I had to do it uh, on my own in a, in a way. You know? Well, and Danny Tanaglia around that time was probably one of your best teachers because he and tw 10 and 12 hour sets would be one of your best teachers because right. he'd have the time to play just about anything throughout the set. Disco, house, techno, all over the place. I imagine it was hard though in some ways to figure out what some of this was. Were there people you were going out with or were you going up to the DJ booth to ask him? How, what was the process? You said you didn't have a Red Bull Music Academy. Yeah, I wish I did. I, I, wish, I, I wish I was a student here, guys, really. I mean, it's... Um um, I I don't know. It depends. I sometimes would go out with um, with Rami with some friends, whatever. And sometimes I just go um, and listen, not even dance. Just try to understand the grooves and um, listen to a new way, basically. Because the way I think of music, and I, I still fight against this, um, fight in a good sense, not in a bad sense. But I still separate the elements very much into melody, harmony, rhythm. Base basically layers of of musical elements, whereas uh, in electronic music, uh, it, this is all very relative. It's all about sounds more than uh, about the notes, I guess. Um, is that what was uh, some of it? Is that what was immediately appealing to you that you kind of couldn't tell? It kind of all jumbled together in a way. What was the melody and the harmony, and it switched. Definitely, because because in a in a good techno track you can have um, a harmony which basically functions as a rhythmic impulse thing, and it doesn't matter what harmony it is. Or I mean, I hear it, but it could be something else, and and it still f uh, fulfills its purpose, which is to give a rhythmic uh, pulse to the to the track. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm always I was always attracted to things that were on the opposite end of my uh, spectrum, so. Um, I, I had to, you know, I had to get my way into it. And uh, but then, of course, um, you know, people like John Cage um, already predicted this in the '30s um, that music will no longer be uh, notes and layers of bass and harmony and melody, but it will be just sounds. It will, composers will be sound artists. He called them. And uh, this is from a lecture in 1938, where uh, John Cage, I think, was probably about 50 years early in the way we, um, we understand music, we, we try to approach music. Um, why don't we play a track, um, one of your renditions, I guess, of an electronic uh, track. Uh, two, three points to anyone who can recognize this. This is off of Not For Piano. That was uh, Audiker Andover, right? Tell me um, the other some of the other things that you chose to uh, rearrange. Would you play? I guess the first question would be: What would you say that you did? Uh, how, what was the word you would describe? You, you said rendition. Cover? Rendition. Yeah. Extraordinary rendition. <laughs> <laughs> um. um most of them were Detroit techno tracks, and that one was not. But not unrelated. Not, not unrelated, unrelated at all. Related. Sure. Um, I, I included uh, these classics, I suppose, as... Um, Jeff Mills, The Bells, Derek right. May, Strings of Life. And Audiker. Um, it was basically to... Um, indicate what the album could be about, because uh, it was a piano album after all. Uh, it's the first time I published my pieces, but um, by including a few techno classics, or uh, you know, one IDM classic, I suppose, I just wanted to hint at the direction uh, where the album is, you know, maybe targeted. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to do um, a recollection of of classics. Uh, I just included these pieces to say 
okay, this, this is about electronic music, even though I'm playing the piano. And, uh, you know, when, if you put the bells, then there's no doubt about it, uh, in a way. Um, I, I do, did a few versions uh, of Carl's, Carl's music, um, Carl Craig. Uh, I played technology uh, a lot, and uh, I played technology um, at Carnegie Hall. Uh, which uh, which was which was nice because uh, I think that was the first time uh, Carl's music was performed at, Carl at Carnegie Hall, and also on the same program I had played uh, Fresco Baldi, uh, which I played yesterday night, a piece from 1607, and that was also the first time it was performed at Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. So you see how uh, sometimes the extremes uh, meet meet uh, meet up in. Um, Situ very concrete situations like that, like an institution, uh, how it targets the programming for just one kind of repertoire and leaves out completely the extremes. You know. How do you get to a point um, in your classical career? Um, you had a number of things out um, on various classical labels that I saw. Um, how do you get it to a point where you can say in a performance, all right, I'm um, also just going to add uh, the bells onto this tonight. As pure provocation, perhaps. Um, and who's letting you do that as well? There's, you, there's can, you set the agenda. You say, I'm playing Frescobaldi, and then last thing, I'm going to improvise or I'm going to play the bells. Yeah, usually I do other way around. Uh, yeah, my teacher uh, said, tell your best jokes first. I think my best jokes are is my own stuff or or the more electronically driven stuff. So I'd start with that and then finish with Frescobaldi, which is also an, a really nice way, I think, to discover old music uh, in a new context. Um, like like I did yesterday, the Frescobaldi sort of came out of um, of my piece, Hello. And I mean, there is no nobody who, who monitors this. I mean, nobody is going to tell me what to do. I think um, the stage is really a, a space of freedom, and, and I like it to be a, a complete artistic freedom. Um, it's not a it's not a place to uh, to be afraid of. Um, quite the contrary, it's a it's a place to go out. It's a space to try to uh, go as 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 far as you can. Um, the thing is with promoters, sometimes uh, classical promoters have a few very uh, strict ideas of what they want and sometimes you have to negotiate you have to uh, you know you have to try to to meet him halfway but then you also want to do your own stuff and um, but I always had great experiences with um, with classical audience uh, hearing you know for example you know strings of life or or Carl Carl Craig's technology or something like that I think the audience can never be underestimated um, I'm not sure about promoters, but the the audience definitely is. Uh, there is no, you know, uh, you cannot put a, a say um, a listing of what audience is best because I'm I'm sometimes so surprised by uh, elderly people who come up to me after a show and they said, yeah, well, what was this piece where you played uh, inside the piano? And I said, well, it's, uh, strings of life. And I said, oh, but does the composer know you you do? Uh, you play inside the piano, and this was some years ago, and said, well, the composer probably doesn't even know I play this piece. I said, and then she was very shocked, the lady, and she said, well, how does that work? How, how do you get the score? I said, well, there's no score. And then she said, yeah, but how do you, how do, you do it? And I said, well, I listen, and I try to uh, do a version. So I like, I like the term version very much, uh, more than rendition, maybe. Uh, everything is a version, of course. Uh, even the original Strings of Life is just a version. Um, there is there is several original versions. There is, um, and then I think there is uh, Derek May's original idea, which we cannot capture because it's not captured uh, on sound. It's not captured on a score. Uh, so the the original Strings of Life is a version. So it's it it goes on in circles, version of a version of a version, and. Um, I think that's exactly what the old composers like Bach and uh, Vivaldi and Frescobaldi did. They were great remixers of their times. 
Bach was a great remixer. He he heard the theme he liked by uh, some Italian composers, picked it up, used it in, in his own music, didn't even credit the original composer, just said, this is my concerto. And it's basically a remix. And um, so that's, again, one more analogy between you know the Baroque age and our times, which is uh, definitely the age of, of remix. Um, was Strings of Life the first one that you decided to do? on the piano. Uh, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. What was it about that track that immediately said to you, uh, I can do this, or I have a way in, or this is the one? Um, f for one thing, I'm kind of sorry I missed the whole um, techno uh, thing that was happening end of the 80s, early 90s. I was too young. Um, I got into it in early 2000, which was still okay, but you know the classics were, were had had been gone, uh, not gone, but they passed. And uh, so when I heard Strings of Life, I I I remembered it, but I didn't know from where. I was like, I know this tune, but what is it? What is it? And um, and then I don't know how how I I discovered the title. Even I think I went to one of Carl's. Uh, DJ sets and he played it, and then the me the melody was very very um, uh, very much stuck in my mind, and I was just doing some research and I I, I remember found this internet site with um, cell phone rings for some strange reason and one of the rings was strings <laughs> strings of life and it's like oh so this is it <laughs> strings of life okay so then I you know. I found out. You know, Did you use it as your ringtone after that? No, I didn't. I didn't. I never downloaded a single ringtone from any site. But um, I like the harmonies of that piece. Again, it's, um, I, I when when the harmonies are appealing, I want to do something with it. And it's the same with the Gibbons. You know, you're a harmony guy. I'm a <laughs> I'm a harmony guy. No, I'm I'm. I guess I'm more a percussive guy actually. But when when the harmony is uh, surprising and the second chord of, of strings of life is really surprising i don't know if it's still on but transformation between the two the two chords uh, kind of like world world apart um, but within a very short time span and I suppose that's that's what made me want to use it in a way I don't know Derek's background as well as I should but it seems like the type of chord change that a non composer a naive sort of you know like oh this sounds kind of nice would make and that someone who's more classically trained would never think to have made that connection yeah, perhaps maybe. maybe um when you played strings of life did you immediately go into the piano uh, at the end um or was that something that came about over time when you um felt like you had a handle on the piece yeah i I did play inside the piano already before before I did Strings of Life, and it just seemed like um, a cool ending to to the version. Um, unfortunately, for the vinyl, uh, for the release, there was not enough space on side B, so we had to cut this part. And so, um, I suppose when I when I play live now, it's my revenge. I make that part especially long, and it's because I, I just love to play. I had so much gear in the piano yesterday, I couldn't really reach into the piano the way I, I'm used to. I mean, when it's clear, you have such a range of sounds. You have the, um, uh, all the metal and um, the wood. I mean, I wasn't even getting there because I had the computer and uh, all the MIDI controllers and stuff. But um, yeah, it's not on the vinyl. The, that part is not on the original release. Um, the label that you release for Infine, um, it's a French label, and it seems like it's one of the few labels in the electronic world that would be open to something like this. How did you get hooked up with them? Who was the person that you talked to at the label? What was the driving force behind starting going down this road? 
Um, it was one show in Paris, I think it was 2005. And it was a show where I played a mixed program with very old music, some Bach, some Berio. And I finished the program with Strings of Life. And um, after the show, uh, this guy walks up to me, and it was Alexandre Kazak. And he said, uh, your Strings of Life is great. And um, I've been wanting to uh, set up a label for a long time. I think now, now is the time I want to do it. And so basically, he introduced me to his team, he introduced me to Agoria. And uh, I recorded the first version of Strings of Life pretty, pretty soon after that. Um, and then the, the, the version on, my, on, my first, on the album uh, was recorded a bit later uh, on a better piano and a better, better settings in general. On the Andover thing we listened to, you can hear some electronic. Uh, stuff going on in the background and it's all over the album in places. When did that come into play? When did you start playing with software or other instruments and you know to bring that into the fold? Um, a while ago I, I was always um, trying to expand the, 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 the sound of the piano with, with keyboards. Um, I loved uh, people like Joe Zawinul, for example, and um, watching these videos from the 70s where he has... Uh, this is the keyboardist from Weather Report. Exactly, right? exactly. But he's actually also a classical pianist, and uh, then he was a bebop pianist with uh, Cannonball Adderley, and then he met Miles, and then he went his way. Um, but he basically never played with less than six keyboards or, or synthesizers, and then there were these uh, pieces of furniture behind him, um, basically uh, like furniture of sound because a, a synthesizer in 72 uh, was not just a keyboard you had to bring you know the rack and the rack was maybe you know two meters high or something um, and I, th I thought that was fascinating how you can switch sounds so easily and um, and try to build your own language with uh, the way you combine the different sounds so, uh, like I said before, at Juilliard, uh, there was a great music lab, which did have some amazing uh, old gear. Um, I completely fell in love with the Yamaha D uh, DX7, which is uh, very basic, in version one, though. And I started using that and making my first tracks while I was uh, a student. And uh, so the idea to go beyond just the piano and, and but it's composition, it's the same thing, production or composition. Uh, whether you sit down at the table and you write uh, the, the music on paper or you are at the computer and you program it, uh, I think there's no difference. Um, the difference is for me when I try to arrange it so I can perform it live and uh, still play the piano in, a, in an attractive way for me and not just, uh, you know, loop stuff. Um, I love to play loops live, you know, because I think they... Um, I have no issue playing the same thing over and over, as you might have noticed yesterday. Um, but I think if you, if you loop something uh, real time, which is you play the same thing over and over, uh, it's, it's so uh, alive, much more than if I just press record and then play and then loop it. So on Not For Piano, there's a whole bunch of uh, piano loops, but they're all played out. So, um, and maybe, you know, the Otecker uh, tune was edited down to six minutes, but it could be that I'd play this f for about 20 minutes. And basically always the same thing. Then look for the good, the good parts and cut them, edit it together. It must be hard to play loops over and over, but you say you find it quite easy. And, um, it's not about easy or hard. I think it's, um, it's, just, it's just me. I love to play loops, you know? I'm, I, I, don't, I have no issue with it. Um, some, some people, um, uh, you know, in Aufgang, for example, my band, uh, Rami is like, uh, you, play, you play the loops, I, I do the free stuff. Okay, no problem. I have no issue playing the same bass line. Um, because that's the thing, you know, if you program something, uh, you, can, you can record a, a one-bar a one bar thing and then loop it, and it's going to be static for the rest of your track. Or you can actually record, even, even MIDI, you can record the bass line but record the whole track, record it live. And if it's a six minute track, you'll play the, the bass line for six minutes. And that's how I, I do most of my tracks, actually. I, I play as much live as I can. 
I loop as little as I can. You know, rhythmic uh, programming is a different thing um, because you also need the quantize to be uh, to be right. But bass lines are so much groovier when they're off. I think uh, they're so much more um, appealing when they're not always falling on on the same spot within the bar. If they move a little bit, because we're not machines. Um, I think we're not machines yet, but uh, w when I when I play a bass line, I, I even though it's the same thing, it's gonna move in time, and um, I think it's it's um, it can only be beneficial for the track to do longer loops or to play them out live. Let's play a track from Afgang. Um, you mentioned them a couple times already. Um, Channel 7? Um, how about that going? Yep. All fine record stores. Um, that was Sonar, right? That's where Alfgang uh, first played, correct? Correct. So that was based off of the memory of the first performance? We actually wrote it for the first performance, one of our first, first pieces, uh, 2005. Yeah. Tell me about the freedom of having a drummer, <laughs> finally. Yeah, it's great, it's great. Um, you know, the first version of Aufgang, we didn't have a drum set. It was two pianos and electronics, and that was it. And after a year, uh, Imrik, the guy who was doing most of the programming, uh, was like, guys, I, I want to use the drums. He's a great drummer. He's played um, with Cassius. Uh, he's played with a whole bunch of rap, rap art, uh, artists in France. And uh, Phoenix also is a drummer for Phoenix. So, uh, and, and as soon as we used the, the drum set, I remember the first date was in, in Holland about uh, maybe four years ago. It, the energy just was double on stage. And um, it's really the drums that hold the thing together because we play without click uh, always. Um, we just don't like to play with a kick, with a click. Uh, but you know, we, we do have live MIDI stuff going on on stage. So Emric, Im the drummer, he's, he's on click. And then we just follow him and he's holding it together. Um, so it's, it's really freedom actually to have, a, to have a drum set on stage, it really is. Why, um, how did this start? I mean, obviously you probably wanted to do a project with Rami just because you guys were friends from school, but what was the idea, the guiding principle behind the whole thing? I guess it took us a while to, to figure that out. Um, you know, the first album came together after three or four years of playing together and um, composing, trying to find our sound. Um, and then we added the drum set, and it was a whole different thing uh, after after a while. I guess that was the moment at which you realized, oh, we have something really. Yeah, definitely. But also, like the compositions, uh, the, the the tunes, we um, we were trying to uh, to to make them so that uh, that we would be free, um, and and especially when because it was a live project first of all. Uh, like I said, the album took a while to come together. Um, but definitely, the drum set was one large uh, one la leap forward in our sound. Um, but most of of the um, the work we do behind doors, we do uh, you know at the computer. We send each other files, and um, uh, Emrik is uh, sending you know new bass lines, and then you know Rami and I uh, compose the, the piano stuff on top, and then we record MIDI, we send it back, and then we get together. It's complicated because we live in three different uh, countries. Uh, so we don't see each other so much, uh, so often. But um, so it's always a very intense, intense way of, uh, of working. Now we do have a space in Paris where we, we meet occasionally. And we just recorded our second album. So uh, we're working on that. Um, and it, I think it's kind, kind of different from, from this, um, in the sense that this is, this is really produced. Uh, the pianos are played live, the drums is played live, but all the rest is pretty much laid out uh, in the studio and, uh, you know, MIDI. 
I think the new album is going to be much more of a live feel, and you you hear um, you hear f a few you know a few moments where it's it sounds more more rocky, I guess. Um, but that could be also the sound of the drums in general. You know, as as soon as a drummer uh, gets out of of himself, uh, because Emrik he's he's like a uh, he's like a machine, really. But then he can also be like a like a rock drummer, and uh, yeah, we have we're to tell him to settle down sometimes. Yeah, we do, we do. Um, it's funny because we just played. Uh, Is it hard being in a band for you? I mean, you know, coming from this classical background and having to negotiate that. No, it's a relief. It's a relief because um, when we're together, it's it's the kind of vibe that you know anything could happen. We're kind of invincible. Whereas uh, when you're alone on tour and and you know you have different projects, but you're always alone, traveling alone, preparing alone, concentrating alone, uh, to hang out with your brothers finally is is like a relief. And um, when there's a really good vibe, um, we just toured, uh, we had a small tour about about a month ago, and um, it was it was really nothing could go wrong. Um, you do a lot of collaboration anyway. You worked with Carl Craig. Um, you've worked with Moritz von Oswald sometimes together. I guess let's talk about Carl first. Um, you met him. You went to see him DJ, and you met him afterwards, said hello. And then I think the Infine had introduced you to, correct, at some point? Exactly, Alexandre. Alexandre had... Um a year after we unofficially met at a club in Holland, uh, Alex. Uh, what do you think was in Alex's mind? Because I think, as the story goes, he said, I think you two need to talk for a while. Yeah, something like that. Something what did you think he thought was going to happen? For once, Carl remembered, remembered me. He remembered us because we walked up to him with Rami, actually. He said, oh, you... You're the guys who came up to me uh, after the gig. He said, "Yeah, um, yeah, Alex. He, he didn't have a precise, uh, preci precise goal, but uh, he he knew that I was listening to a lot of Carl's music. Uh, I mean, by the time I met Carl, I probably kno knew all his music by heart. Uh, and when I say by heart, I, I you know I could play all the stuff. Uh, um, so I was really, really, really into his music and." I guess about six months later, uh, I went I went to Detroit for the first time, and um, we worked on the Melody remix. That was the first uh, the first collaboration, and um, it's funny because the um, the original piano takes from the Melody were taken uh, in a classical way, so not necessarily close miking, but more like uh, ambient miking thing. And Carl is like, I can't use those takes for for my remix. You better come to Detroit, and we do this again. So, I went to Detroit, and um, and I re-recorded uh, some piano parts, some bass parts, um, and then the you know he he made the two remixes, and uh, that was the first thing that we started uh, working on Inner Zone together, and um, and then one big thing was with the orchestra, uh, which was called Versus. Um, it has evolved since we've done some other. Some I think other the video is still online of uh, this performance in Paris, mm -hmm. where he's on electronics and you're playing piano, and there's this enormous orchestra playing stuff. Right, it must have been pretty special. It was a lot of work. Um, I, I spent um, I spent about two or three months arranging the stuff for orchestra, and. Um, then we got a conductor, and so he was on the project for a while, and then we had a w one week of rehearsals, and uh, it all came together, I suppose, uh, the day of the show, really, because uh, for orchestra to work uh, with electronic musicians, it's not, it's not easy. Uh, also, there's a whole bunch of technical things you need to coordinate, like, um, like the sound. I mean, we play amplified, we play with uh, on-stage monitors, some had click tracks, I had click tracks for this. Um, and the conductor had a click track, but he was dancing by the end of the show. He was on stage, and he didn't look like he was conducting. He was just having a, having a great time. Um, yeah, it was a great experience, and uh, to be repeated, definitely. And so we've we've evolved the project into 
some other other versions in um, in Germany this year we played a couple of shows where I conduct the orchestra and we sort of play much more freely now it's kind of like a DJ set uh, between Karl Moritz and I and at times the orchestra comes in and then drops out again uh, sort of like a continuous mix of music what's the most surprising thing to you about Karl before having worked with him when you worked with him um, surprising I don't know I think Carl is uh, is a, a great personality in the sense that uh, he doesn't he doesn't think um, small he doesn't think techno necessarily and uh, I think there is some comparison to be drawn with Miles Davis who definitely did not think jazz only who definitely went beyond that um, this kind of personality that uh, is so important for uh, his or her own art, but then also very important for the artists around around them who are not necessarily doing the same thing. And there's only a few persons, a few people who can uh, who can do that. I think um, it's you know it's complicated to make it happen because um, first of all, if you start working with classical musicians, you have to adapt your language. You can't talk about groove. They have no idea what groove means. Um, you can't talk about um, you know the feel of things. That doesn't make sense. It's all it's all written out. It's all you know. It's all notes on paper. So you were you his translator, uh, or was, was he? Does he have that language now? Is he able to speak in those terms? Yeah, I think we all we all learned a lot. We all were in the process of learning this. But I was definitely some kind of mediator between the two worlds, uh, and the conductor did a great job of of making it happen with with the orchestra. Um, but it's basically um, getting to know each other and uh, orchestra musicians are yet another special breed of classical musicians um, and sometimes it's really hard to make it happen and uh, also you know I love to play loops but orchestra players they hate to play loops and when they have one bar written and it says 268 times they get kind of upset and say like well after you know after 100 bars you see they're off by like a by like a beat and so I'm, I'm like stopping the thing and I said you know you're off by a beat I said yeah but I've already played it a hundred times <laughs> what? You, know, you have a hundred sixty eight more, times more. To go. Um, Moritz von Oswald uh, has done some not production it's other words that you use to describe what he's done on some of the records I think on the was it the Bach Cage one that it, he was credited as enchanting or something like that? That was Oracle. Oracle, Oracle. by on. Okay. Yeah. What, what does that mean? Uh, it's, a, it's a mystery, secret. Um, no, Moritz did. Uh, I, I worked on record, I, I worked a couple of times. One was Oracle, and the, la the last record uh, is, is Bach Cage, which he produced full on, so no mystery about that. But um, Oracle Bio On is um, is a kind of production that I I um, it, it came very spontaneously from my part. I had a whole bunch of piano samples. There's no live piano on this record. It was kind of the direct an antagonist to Not for Piano, which is a piano record where I play live. Uh, Oracle was the other end. There's no live piano. It's only samples, and I did the mix inside the box, and I basically had a stereo file. Uh, which sounded okay, but I'm no sound engineer, and I'm definitely no mastering engineer. And so um, I counted on Moritz to make it sound good, and he, I think he did. And uh, so it was definitely more than, um, than a mastering job, because a mastering uh, job basically means EQing and maybe compressing a little bit, and that's it. But uh, he managed to uh, feature some parts of the... Uh, of the original and maybe um, process them again, uh, isolating s several frequencies and is um, processing them. And so the, the, whole, the whole track bec you know, becomes, uh, he made a kind of a 3D version of, of a 2D track. Um, and uh, for Bach Cage, um, it was, it was, he was very present from the beginning on. We had, um, it was a project where I played some music of Bach and Cage and um, a few pieces of mine, very very short, 
uh, one of which we had the pleasure yesterday with the um, students to play on stage. And uh, Moritz, basically, um, we set up the mics, we um, processed the music uh, together, um, and you can definitely hear the Moritz von Oswald touch on, on Bach Cage, more than on Oracle, because he basically had more freedom. Can we play uh, something from the Bach Cage sure. where we can kind of hear Moritz? How about, how about this one? Can we get this one? a piece from uh, 1948 uh, by John Cage called In a Landscape and uh, basically what we did is uh, we had about 20 mics on the piano uh, of which we used maybe half um, and uh, maybe some were just um, regular we during the mix the way they were recorded and then the other five mics went into a whole side chain of processing uh, boxes like uh, this heavy ring modulator, this the uh, Moritz von Oswald uh, delay and of course reverb and uh, a phaser. So and it's all basically live. Um, I mean live in the post-production. So I recorded the take live and then uh, Moritz uh, processing was done as a second layer sort of. And um, this is for me uh, an important an important record because uh, it's the first time I uh, were not I was not afraid to use um, these processing tools for so-called classical production. Uh, John Cage is not necessarily a, a classical composer, but it's the label is still a classical label, and it came out on Deutsche Grammophon, right. which I think is important to note. Right, and also if you go to a record store, John Cage will be in the classical section. Um, it's not a current thing to do, to use ring modulators when you uh, record the classical piano album. But that's exactly what I did for the previous album, which was my music, Idiosyncrasia. Um, most of the pieces I played yesterday are on my second album, I, I guess my third album. Um, but now I there's, there's no... Uh, there's no return. I think I told you this before. This is a, um, for me, there's no difference now if I play classical music. And when I say classical, it's really... Uh, quotes. Quotes. I mean, I don't even know what it means, really. Um, I think we use it in a, in a kind of anachronistic way. Because classical, the word classical itself uh, is kind of recent. It's about 150 years old, and uh, it was used to, to describe the music before that. So now, 150 years later, uh, we call even music from 50 years ago classical. So um, classical really, really is the same as contemporary in a way. Um, but now for me, there's, like I said, no difference. If I, if I play music by a composer from another time or I do my own music, uh, the sound of my piano will always be um, tra um, processed. Um, not always, but mostly, because I think it's, again, one way to evolve the sound of the piano to make it uh, into into something else in in uh, relationship with my own time. I mean, uh, in, in rock productions, in um, techno productions, you use all these machines. But in classics uh, or jazz, you don't. But there's no reason not to. Why did it take you so long to get there? with the classical stuff? Or was it the classical industry also had to get here to allow you to do something like this for Deutsche Grammophon? Why, because you say this uh, record is a breakthrough for you in a way. You felt like you passed through some 
place. Well, like I said, I, the, the whole electronic, uh, my whole electronic education uh, came after, came after my classical education. And I, I guess I didn't know how to, how to uh, combine the two. Um, but now, now I do. Like, um, in fact, there's no difference whether I play uh, a piece uh, by Bach or, uh, or my own music. Um, why it took me so long? I think it's just a, a natural organic process of uh, trying to integrate all the things I learned and uh, trying to define my sound. Um, you know, as a, as a pianist, you spend a lot of time just working on your sound uh, analogically. You you know, it's in the fingertips, it's in the weight of the uh, of the elbow, in the in the arm, the back. It's all important parts of how the piano is going to sound. But then, the mics they pick up something completely different. And uh, when you send the mics into a into a processing box, you get something totally different. But you get something personal, and I suppose it's it's about uh, finding a sound that that describes me best. And um, I have no interest in playing uh, a, um, a, the, the so-called role-playing game of um, classical music, where I interpret something from the past in an old way. Um, if I do it, then I have to do it in new in a new way. And to use the technology uh, definitely helps me in that direction. It must have also been a big deal from the other side um, to have Moritz doing a classical record. Um, you, Definitely. Did you did it take some convincing of the record label? I'm bringing my own guy in. Just trust me. No, no, no. It's actually uh, he was he was. He's already done the record, I guess, with Carl. Yeah, he'd done recomposed. Um, he was he was in it from the start. We wanted to do this together and. Uh, Recombos is not, as, not entirely the same thing. It's kind of a remix project. Um, it's not necessarily a classical playlist. But uh, Maurizio was excited. He was uh, totally excited to do it because um, I guess it's kind of some kind of challenge too for a, a techno or a dub producer uh, to, to produce music by Bach. Uh, and I love these, uh, I love these completely um, Crazy ideas, um, and Moritz, he, he, you know, almost. I wanted to go further than him. He's like, um, maybe I do something very light, and I said, Moritz, we want more of this ring modulator. Turn it up, turn it up, um, just to give it to give it this special flavor. And um, I was I was very happy yesterday to play with some of you guys because. Um, uh, the piece we did um, was based on this uh, very short excerpt. Um, I say excerpt because it was cut down on the original record to one minute and a half. Um, and there is a remix uh, by Lawrence. I don't know if you want to listen to it real quick. Sure. Um, and this is also on Deutsche Grammophon. Coming through, but there's no sound. Last one? Yeah, I'm lucky. And for anyone who was there last night, they can immediately recognize the little melodic uh, riff there. Um, I find it interesting that Lawrence, given the chance to uh, do a mix of a John Cage piece, to do a mix of a Bach piece, he chose you. Not that you aren't, you know, fantastic yourself. Oh, thank you, but um, yeah, I was I was happy that he chose to to do a introit, and um, I think of all my pieces as some kind of um, work in progress where. Um, like I said before, every original piece is already a version of some uh, previous idea. 
which we cannot fully grasp because it's in the head of the composer or the, or the producer. And obviously when you do a record, uh, there's a lot of effort that goes into editing and mastering and so already the, the piece is going to sound different, it's going to take a different shape, a different structure. But then the remixing um, by other people is, um, is one, one more version of, it's a collaboration but it's another version. And uh, definitely what we did last night was, uh, was a version, maybe my favorite version so far. Um, I think we could have could have rolled another another half hour or so, um, and so I'm I'm still working on this piece. Um, uh, just the way as I, I still working on, I still work on Hello, the first piece I played last night. Uh, it's the piece is the composition is about five or six years old, but I keep trying to to evolve, make it evolve and go other places. So um, one way to do is with adding programming, adding sequencing. And the other way, like I said, is to uh, is to get other people to remix it. So how do you know when a track on idiosyncrasy, for example, is done? They're not. That's the thing. We we think uh, when but you bring out an album, they are. Yeah, there's <laughs> there one version. There's there's yeah there's so the versions known as idiosyncrasia. But so you just had a deadline that someone gave you. You're like, okay, that's the that's the version I could finish. I guess. I guess. Um, but really, uh, I want to make a point of this. It, you know, it's not when you bring out a record that the music is done. I think it's only the beginning of the music. It's only the beginning of the life of the music. And uh, once once you put out the record, uh, you you understand a few things you didn't understand while you were in the process of making the music. And it would be, I think, it would be too bad to sit back and just say, "Hey, the music is out. I'm done." And uh, okay, if someone wants to remix it, cool, you know. But I'm not going to touch it again. Um, I think it's just the beginning. Uh, when you bring out a record, you know, we we think you know that's the end, and the media say you know it's a good record, or it's a bad record, uh, it's better than the last one, or it's worse than the uh, the, the previous one. Um, but actually, it's it's just one long process, and each record is going to be. Uh, related to, to the previous one and it's going to hint towards the next one and it's basically one large work in, pro uh, work in progress. Uh, it's definitely not defi definitive versions. It's kind of related and one of the things you said when I interviewed you about six months ago or something like this is that all great composers find their own language, define their own language and I wonder if you feel like you're getting there that you're finding your own language? Or is it just a work in progress? Yeah, I think it's not up to me uh, to, de to determine whether I found my language or not, but um, I started this thing about 10 years ago trying to combine uh, the sound of the piano with the sound of electronic music because I, I love both. I, I love the sound of the piano, I love uh, techno, and um, so I, I was under the impression that there's still a lot of things to do, and I'm, I'm still under this impression. And so again, it's only the beginning. Um, if if you can find some idiosyncratic uh, things about uh, about my music, then I suppose that's a good that's a good thing. Um, but I'm not done, you know. I'm not done. So. Now I explored uh, the same idea, but in a more classical repertoire. Uh, the next project could be something completely, completely different, uh, more towards the future, as opposed to the past. But uh, the aesthetics is still going to be the same, because it's um, it's it's kind of like a, a sound research thing, where um, you get ideas, you try to develop them, and um, you know you bring out records, and they help you sort of put a put a a milestone in your own progress, in your own um, development, but they are in, in uh, by no way are they to be taken as um, as the last word. Um, so I'm always a little surprised when um, you know when, for example, the press um, uh, you know they they think as the album is like okay that's that's a new thing and it's finished and I, I really don't think that way. Uh, I think it's it's w each album is one step in uh, in whatever you're doing in music. You know? 
Spock and Cage seem like unlikely bedfellows. In your mind, what was the connection and why did you want to put them next to one another on an album? Well, for, once, for one thing, it's my uh, conviction that uh, the old music does not have to be shielded from contemporary music. And con actually, contemporary mu kinds of music, in plural, because contemporary music, there's a lot of, st a lot of stuff. Um, I like to put um, a juxtaposition of old and new, but in a sort of continuous way. In fact, Bach Cage is kind of like a DJ set with music by Cage and Bach, sort of alternating. So it's, it's the statement, the first statement is uh, the old music is actually part of our language. We're going to hear it in 2011 the same way as we hear, uh, you know, the newest techno production. Um, and then Cage and Bach definitely do connect on several levels. Um, I think it's, uh, they're both um, minimalists, definitely. Um, Bach is one of the great, f the first, one of the first great minimalists. Um, mm. There is something very, very similar in the way they, uh, they write their scores. Um, they are kind of, uh, kind of very basic scores. There's no indications, just the music and a title and maybe, maybe a word or two. Uh, Bach doesn't even write the word. It's just a title and the music, and that's it. And um, they connect on a on a, on a rhythmic uh, on a rhythmic level. They use very definite rhythmic forms, uh, rhythmic patterns. Bach's music, uh, especially Bach's instrumental music, is all based on on dance, uh, uh, on dance, on Baroque for forms of dance, which nowadays seem completely out, like uh, Sarabande. Would you like to dance a Sarabande with me? I have no idea how to dance a Sarabande. But I suppose, you know, 300 years ago, people did know what a Sarabande is, just as we know what, uh, you know, a house track is, you know, or a dubstep or whatever dance you want to call it. Um, and John Cage uses uh, uses these patterns, and th he's very strict. So that the piece we listened um, in a landscape sounds like this dreamy thing, uh, sort of ambient stuff. But actually, the uh, the rhythmic structure is completely defined, and I don't remember exactly, but it's completely separated in um, in several se sections where the total amount of beats is uh, a sum of the previous section. It's kind of a crazy. Uh, crazy uh, organization of rhythm, but it's definitely comparable to Bach. And last but not least, I think both are um, very, um, very spiritual in the sense that they are uh, very abstract and um, kind of universal. You don't, um, I feel when I listen to music by Bach or by Cage, I, I, don't, I don't need any other information and I, it, it transports me to somewhere. Um, I don't know where, but uh, it's um, it's a kind of feeling that I get um, that they had a really high understanding of of the humans. Um, I don't want to philosophize too much about this, but um, Bach Cage also four letters and same first name, you know, John Sebastian Bach and John Cage. So we got a few analogies. Um, before we open up the questions, I wanted to ask you, you recently played at Space Ibiza. I think it was with Carl. Um, was this the first time you've played in a club environment like that with the grand piano? Uh, no, we already did Space with Carl the previous season. Was, okay, I'm sorry. So it was a repeat. Um, and I do play in clubs a lot, but it's rare to have a grand piano. That's, that's for sure. Um, in fact, I also did the um, uh, closing party with Luciano at um, Pacha Vagabundos, and we didn't have a piano. It was too complicated. Stage was too small, and uh, I suppose space is easier to to put it has a, a piano. Has a very big stage. Yeah. Has a good stage, and there's like a space uh, besides the DJ booth. Uh, Pacha is more complicated because, you know, Luciano is over there in the booth, and and it's crowded, and it's. Uh, and, and then, you know, I was about 20, 25 meters on the opposite side, and we barely saw each other, but it was all 
basically trying to, to connect in the music. Um, I love to play in clubs and um, what I did yesterday is, is kind of a hybrid thing. Um, uh, usually what I, what I do um, is either I play a, a piano recital in a, in a hall, in a seated hall. It could be amplified, could have electronics, but it's not necessarily beady or dancey. Or I do, um, I do a, a techno set, live set for, for dance floors uh, in clubs with keyboards. I usually have about two or three keyboards plus my, uh, my little machines and the computer. So yesterday was kind of a hybrid uh, because um, it was kind of a concert, but I was also playing some, some, more, uh, some more beats than I usually would do in a concert hall. Also because uh, the sound system in concert halls is uh, mostly not adapted for subby, subby music, so you have to go easy on, on the speakers. Is there an ideal place? I mean, because I saw people sitting down and sort of moving in their chairs, and I was like, they're not quite comfortable. The people standing up were like, maybe wanting to sit down. <laughs> is there a place that you feel like is the ideal format to hear what you do? No, uh, for me, they're, they're, they complement each other very, very well, and it's kind of vital for me to switch and uh, play in different environments. I think every hall is ideal. Uh, as long as you try to get as get get it all out what, what, when you feel uh, when you feel the vibe and you can connect with the with the audience, whether it's a quiet audience uh, sitting in chairs and 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 you know taking it easy or it's a crazy audience dancing uh, as if there was no tomorrow um, it's uh, it's it's complementary i you know I love to go back and forth and uh, and also these hybrid uh, formats, I think, are very interesting because um, uh, there may be new new sensations. You don't really know what to expect, and uh, in fact, I don't know what to expect. I mean, I know what I want to play, but I uh, I adapt. You know, I had a, some some track list, some set list in my mind before I I started playing yesterday, and then it, it was completely changed through throughout the show because I just was feeling it out, and um, and of course. Um, it all had to lead up to the to the grand finale um, with with the students. So cool. Well, speaking of the students, uh, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? Hi, I've got two questions. Um, first, we were talking. You were talking earlier about the history of the piano, and the um, to my knowledge, when the piano. Uh, was first invented, uh, there wasn't a set tuning scale at that time, so people tuned their own pianos. Have you explored any different tuning systems at all, or do you stick with the classic 12-tone system? Mm -hmm. uh, you're right. It's, um, it has been formatted only actually from Bach on, pretty much. Before Bach, there was a few very, very distinctive uh, tuning systems. Uh, tuning is really um, a profession on its own. I mean, I can play around, um, but I eventually break. <laughs> I'll break. Uh, I'll break the piano if I if I tune it too much. Um, but I have worked with tuners, uh, crazy guys who who are absolutely willing to uh, experiment with the tuning, and you can you can get into uh, antique kind of tunings where uh, the relationship of the intervals uh, is specific to each key. So, um, for example, if, if, I, if I tell uh, this, this very special tuner I know, uh, look, I'm going to play some music by uh, Frescobaldi, and the keys are F major and A minor and uh, C major, and then he thinks for a second, that, okay, and then he starts tuning, and every modulation is, is such a big event because the relationship between the intervals is shocking. We don't hear it that way. Uh, or you can go uh, a completely different way. You can go and uh, tune it with quarter tones and uh, go into more traditional uh, Arab scales, for example, um, or get into uh, completely crazy tuning systems. Everything is possible, but I can't, I can't do it on my own. I need, I need the tuner to do it for me. Thank you. And um, secondly, you, your exploration of electronica and um, piano or classical music you've said the word techno a lot and does that mean that you're really only interested in working with a four four 
um, feet pattern or are you interested in like because a piano like you're saying is a percussive instrument so and you're talking about sort of um, you know complex percussive uh, things that interest you but then when it comes to the electronic part the producers that you're working with seem to stick to a four four mm. um, kind of format so do you have any interest in doing something that's more um, complicated or different? Definitely, definitely. Uh, I have no issue with the four on the floor. I, I, I love it. Um, but uh, the cool thing about having the four equal beats is that you can do so much between the beats. And if you have a kick drum, uh, you know, uh, accentuating e every beat, what I do harmonically or rhythmically on the piano is pretty much all syncopated. And, uh, you know, there's so much space between the beats to to make to make the groove happen um so i don't think it's um it's not like a, like a limit or anything it's just a common denominator uh just as uh, you know in in classical music you have uh, certain figures like uh, alberti bass uh you know i can i can show this briefly something like this that's all over classical music you hear something like that and it's always the same but it's always different so um but yeah, I, I definitely like abstract beats, and uh, I've worked uh, with uh, some other people like Sutek, who's not onto uh, not into four heavy four on the floor, um, and uh, and I'm I'm definitely also a lot in, into sound music where there's no beat at all. Um, in fact, um, the piano has also this kind of ambient properties where you don't need no beat. In fact, you can just it can just be spacey, you know, so. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I play drums, and I feel like in the last 25 years, pretty much all the evolution in rhythm and beat culture has come from people who don't play drums. And I think that's kind of a common perception amongst a lot of drummers. It's electronic music, pro programmers and producers who have evolved beat culture. Mm -hmm. So do you feel the same way about harmony? Interesting, interesting point. Um, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I think once we got machines, uh, and I don't only mean drum machines, but also synthesizers, the way organic musicians play has, has changed, absolutely. And uh, you said uh, before that uh, the chord progression, um, this very specific chord progression could be from a non-composer because it's just basically playing around and find the chords. And um, th what I find interesting is that it becomes, it becomes another language. It becomes a new kind of thing. I mean, Detroit techno, for example, you hear a lot of pentatonic stuff. Uh, it's laid out pretty easily um, because it's just the black keys, for example. But it becomes it becomes a very specific sound, and then you, the way you listen to it, uh, I, I don't I don't necessarily hear it as a as a pentatonic scale. Uh, I hear it as a new sort of uh, uh, conglomerate of of pitches that just determine what the harmony of the piece is going to be. I'm not sure h uh, how far I would go with the analogy, though. Um, I mean, uh, I I have learned a lot of. Uh, I think Carl Craig is a great har harmonizer, for example. Uh, he's, he's got some great harmonies, and um, and so is Mad Mike uh, from Underground Resistance. He's actually more from a gospel sort of jazz uh, background, and um, but then again, these these uh, evolutions uh, they're not linear in in a way that it's not uh, before it was that and now it is that, but it's now it's basically a circle. We go back and we can go for, um, forward. We can go backwards. And um, it, it just becomes a much richer uh, harmonic language, just as it's become a much m richer um, a rhythmic language since uh, the advent of, of beat, beat machines and stuff like that. Um, so I think now it's, it's basically uh, just about amplifying your field. And um, definitely uh, we have to learn from each other. And it's, it's only about this, I think. Um, but you're definitely right. I mean, the, the the beatboxing, you know, has has changed a lot, a lot of perception in in rhythmic in rhythmic structure when it comes to organic drumming. And I I count myself uh, among among you guys. 
the drummers because, like I said, you know, I um, I play the drums in the piano. I like to play the drums. So, thanks. Hi, Francesco. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First, that version of In a Landscape, where and when was it recorded exactly? Uh, s studio in Berlin, uh, August 2010. Okay. Uh, just that I've, I've been listening to it uh, for a little while. Mm -hmm. And I don't I don't remember where I got it, but uh, the version I have on my computer, the file is totally uncredited, and I had an idea it was you. <laughs> and I was kind of blown away when you played it. I've even sampled it a couple times. I hope that doesn't make any <laughs> legal problems. You won't you won't have a problem with me. You might have one with John Cage's publisher. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and second, uh, do you ever see yourself in the future moving away from the piano? completely and dive deeper into synthesized sounds or maybe even samples, harmonic samples? Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. I think uh, ultimately all, all, these, um, all these projects uh, to combine sounds from electronic and acoustic uh, realms uh, eventually will bring me further from the piano. Um, they're already bringing me further to the piano because I have some other, so many other elements to count on more than the piano. I mean, I'm happy when I have a piano on stage because I feel at home. And uh, you know, if my laptop dies or my MIDI controller goes away or there's no power, or whatever, the piano will still sound. It's kind of like a, 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 a nice companion to have on stage because it will always sound whatever whatever happens. There can be bombs, there can be piano will sound. Actually, there was a piano sounding when the Titanic uh, went went down. I think, um, but yeah, um, definitely the the process is is to limit my um, and I, probably you you noticed. I mean. I don't. I play the piano, but I don't play so much. Uh, and when I play a lot, then it's a loop. It's always the same. I'm not into soloing uh, right hand and uh, chorusing. Um, it's it's kind of um, again. It's more of more of a minimalistic um, approach. And I guess the extreme end would be to not play the piano anymore. It's not for now, but uh, who knows? Could be in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I think th what I noticed yesterday at the show is there's quite a lot of um, kind of emotional content to the music, but that includes quite a lot of dissonance as well. Mm -hmm. um, what's what kind of where does that come from? You know, what's your kind of interest in, in dissonance within that s sort of music? Uh, interesting question. Um, I was reading uh, some some lectures by John Cage the other day, and uh, he said that the old way to compose was basically to discern between consonance and dissonance. And he said the new way to compose is to discern organized sounds uh, versus noise, what he calls noise, could be unorganized sounds or cha chaotic sounds or whatnot. Um, the dissonance is only dissonant if it's surprising. Um, if everything is dissonant, then it's no more dissonant. It just becomes, uh, in a way, consonant. So, I mean, I do like to work with uh, with simple harmonies, simple chords, you know, major triads, minor triads, sometimes a seventh. But then at some point, I like to break it. I like to break it um, just as, as, a, as, a, as a kind of... Um, when you set a marker, you say it's a before and a bef and after. So once you, you introduce the dissonance, all the consonant stuff before will, will be transformed for, for the next part. Do you understand what I mean? So the way I, the way I use it, I suppose, is very um, spontaneous. And, um, and um, I can't really calculate when it's going to come in. Uh, but then, of course, in, in, the, uh, in the programming, there's, there's kind of a lot of dissonance. Because whatever I do at the piano, and I, I, like I said, I like to be as free as I can when uh, when I play live, I like to play both hands, and I mean sometimes you'll see me trying to 
EQ something and I have the right hand still playing, but um, the consonants, uh, the consonants is, is in our ears, so to speak. Um, I mean, nowadays in 2011, uh, we, we hear stuff, uh, we hear everything different. Uh, we hear such a large range of music and nothing is shocking anymore, you know? Um, the most dissonant stuff is not shocking because we've heard it in a way. So uh, I'd like to go the other way. Uh, say, if you play a lot of, you know, pleasing harmonies, um, uh, and then you have something dissonant, it'll be it'll be a shock sort of. And uh, I think that's the what we the first piece I played tonight, uh, Gibbons. Uh, it's kind of the same way because uh, it's it starts out pretty pretty soft and minory. And then all of a sudden it, it goes completely out and uh, it's not necessarily dissonant, but it's a progression which is not within the tonal structure of, of music. And, uh, and it's a surprise. And I think um, I, like to, I like to create new, new context for the way we listen to music, even if it's old music, especially if it's old music. Because like I said, new music can't really shock you anymore. Uh, old music can, I think. Uh, I mean, it's difficult to shock nowadays. I mean, I don't know the last time I was shocked when I heard something, but um, I think it's refreshing to listen to the old stuff. And, uh, you know, the piece I played yesterday was 400 years old and um, very dissonant at times. And uh, so when you th what gets me thinking at least and say, well, maybe this, um, this wall between old and new, you know, it's, it's all kind of an illusion or something. Thanks. Does anyone else have any questions? All right, well, thank you very much, Francesco. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>